title of my talk because I thought modern didn't seem nice, so I put contemporary view of members and uh, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, I've been on a 55-year journey studying chili peppers, and people always ask me, how did you get into chili peppers? Well, that's what Charlie Heiser told me I was going to study. I didn't have much of a choice, and I never presumed I was going to get a PhD, and peppers have taken me on an extraordinary journey. But there's a lot to tell you about the problems out in the marketplace of people understanding the peppers they're dealing with. So I thought I'd bring you up to date on some of the uh, kinds of things we now know. So I entitled the talk, Contemporary um, View, all way. So I'm going to cover four points with you. Uh, discovery of new species, the horticultural dilemma, domestication of species, the domesticated species conundrum, and biogenetic hypotheses and issues. You I realize you can't see very well because I, it's, it's lousy in the original journal. And uh, this is Charlie Heiser's paper back in 1958 that brought to us a pepper that nobody had ever seen and it was not discovered in the wild at all. It was discovered in the market. And the pepper that we're looking at is what you see in this little bag here called Ulupika. It was found in the Indian market in La Paz, Bolivia in 1958, brought back to Indiana University, and grown out. And when it was grown out, this is the plant in the field, in the Lorabai Valley, it grows in a very dry place at about 2,800 meters in elevation. And when it was grown out, it required us to change the description of the genus, because to this point, we had not known anything but rotate flowers suddenly we had companion leaf flowers. Now there are three species we know that have companion leaf flowers. Well, there have been other discoveries since then, and they're always a surprise. The one you see right here, I first learned about in the literature, sitting on a plane flying back to Lima. I'm next to a missionary, and I, he told me where he's from, and I said, you know, you have a species of pepper there that's never been described. And he said, there are no wild peppers. And I said, well, do me a favor, ask your parishioners if they know of a wild pepper, which he did. And about two months later, a box arrived with all these fruits in it, sent to me, brought to me by his daughter, who had returned to the States, and with a note saying, you were right, there is a wild pepper, they know all about it here. <laughs> but he did not. And this ended up being the description of that pepper by Paul Smith, who actually was the original collector of that material, and then a suit of mine, Dan Dingren, myself of a very unusual pepper, which I've still not seen in the wild because at the time I was working in that area, Sundero Luminoso just made it impossible to go to the field. So we did not. The other one here is a recent paper by uh, Lynn Boss, Michael May, and Sandra Knapp of one of the two new species recently found in Bolivia, and that's a 2006 discovery. <coughs> And then, as I was working on a paper that was recently published about where we are on peppers, it goes a long way. You know, it's a real shock when you're trying to describe a variety you name into a new species, and you go through the literature and find out it's already been named Capsicum eschwaii, and I knew nothing about it. <laughs> Here it was named after me, and I knew absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> that is embarrassing. <laughs> However, it's solved a dilemma. Now it could be named after me, and I wouldn't be the one doing that. That's even better. But interesting enough, Gloria Bar Barbosa, who was a student of Armando Hung's University in Cordova, had decided that I should change this to a species, as had Josh Tewksbury when he was doing some work. And it now is a species, and it's the only pepper species that has glandular hairs. A very unique feature, and it occurs only in one small valley in Bolivia. And one of the points I make is we have a number of wide-ranging species, but the vast majority of species of peppers are very local endemics. And that will lead to a problem as we try to do molecular studies, and I'll say something more about that. And this is the list of all those. What's important to realize is when I started my work, we had basically reduced the number of pepper species that we knew to about 24. We're approaching 40 species now. The discoveries that have taken place over the last 40 years of these local endemics has led to an explosion of little-known species 
that have been seen by very few workers, as a matter of fact. The horticultural dilemma. And I use this picture from a really interesting book, which is called Chili Pepper Fever, Mine's Hotter Than Yours, <laughs> which is an interesting way to look at it. Because in this picture that Eduardo Fuss took, and all of his pictures now are archived at the University of New Mexico, a fantastic photographer, you're actually looking at what he thought was the diversity of the bell pepper in its many different forms. So here you have jalapeno and you have different bell peppers, but there are three species of peppers in this picture. So you're looking at capsicum, what we call capsicum frutescens, capsicum chinense, and capsicum annual. And within that you have the habanero, you have Tabasco pepper, and you have the bell pepper and a range of things, scotch bonnet. But the fact is, very few people can look at peppers and actually know what the species are. It's very difficult. I'll emphasize that in another way. It's embarrassing in a moment. And here's another picture by David Carangelo that appeared in Audubon magazine. And again, we have three species in what was published in, as Capsicum annual. So you can see some of the protestants types here. You can see some of the chinensi types here. And then you have typical annual types. And this was put, put together as a horticultural collection, suggesting it was all one species. Bring this really home forcefully to me was I worked with Bill Darcy when we were doing a paper on the peppers of Columbia. And Bill would send me specimens from the Missouri Botanical Garden to identify, and I would return them to him. And we did this over about a year period of time, and then the letter came from Bill. He said, I want you to know that the peppers I've been sending you were all the same accession. I changed the numbers so you would know what I was sending you. And you now identify as one species, something that we have been calling two species. You can't tell these apart. And what they were, were capsicum annual and capsicum frutescens. So I'm supposedly the expert, and I can't tell them apart. So this is how difficult the problem has become, as far as knowing what you're really dealing with. Well, Heiser and Smith, early in their work, basically worked out a schematic of five domesticated species. And this is what still dominates the literature today. It shows you how long things need to take to change over time to really catch up with the, what is being done in the scientific literature by the more popular and horticultural literature. So these were the five that traditionally have been recognized over time. And I published this back in 1980, and still holds true today, that two of the species, Picatum here and Pubescence here, Pendulum and Picatum, those are distinct. Nobody mixed those, those up. It's in this mess here that we have this problem. And various peoples have tried to treat this in very different ways. The areas where these peppers come from, this is from Gene Andrews' book, which really started the modern renaissance of people who think about peppers, shows the distribution of, on the one hand, pubescence here, which is a high altitude pepper. You never find it at low elevations. It's going to be at 2,000 meters. That's where you're going to find it. Over here you see the chinensi quintessence complex that Barbara Pickersgill studied in great detail. And that is basically an Amazonian Caribbean complex as far as what has been their traditional range. And up here you have annuum, and its, re its basic distribution is Mexico, southern United States, and into northern Central America, although it goes all the way down to the Amazon River, but very rare when you get down there. And Mercatum, which is a lowland species, sitting primarily in Amazon. So this again is from Gene Andrews' book, a picture of annual, one form of it. And this is from the book about peppers that Fusco did. And I put it in here only to give you, obviously, the ancestral form of annual. And it's changed to the Tabasco form of annual. And finally, Big Jim, it was produced by Roy Nakayama, a 
Las Cruces, New Mexico, and generate enough money that there's now a professorship there that basically funds an expert on peppers, and that's Paul Bosman, President Tony. So look at this, annual frutescens chinensis, but they're all the same gene pool. If you look at it carefully, that's what you come away with. So then I published a paper that suggested that we were dealing actually with four species. I was wrong, that was what I thought. And then in 2001, Hunsinger suggested that what we really need to do if we're doing it correctly is recognize there are three species. So what we've been calling Chinensi and what we're calling Frutescence really are particular morphological forms of the annual complex. Genetically, these can be crossed back and forth with no difficulty whatsoever. When we look at them molecularly, you virtually cannot tell them apart. That does not make the horticultural sack, I assure you. And I just put this in there to show you the other two domesticated. This is pendulum, or the picatum type, which is lowland Peru. This is the pubescence type, which is always recognizable because it has black seeds. And most peppers have yellow seeds, or cream colored seeds. And pendulum has those black seeds you can see there, a very distinct uh, purple corolla. The yellow spots you see in there are actually nectar flowing out of the flower. And these, again, looking at what we see happening in the complex, this here <coughs> is pure pubescence. Up here is the wild ancestor, and this is the hybrid swarm between that. So we can see the range of what comes out of this. And this is what the Eximium species, the wild species of Bolivia, that most likely gave rise to pubescence, looks like. And here's a pubescence plant. We measured it from one end to the other, it was 63 feet long, single plant. I've also seen Eximium grown in a yard, a wild pepper grown in a yard, that measured 10 inches in diameter. So it abuses your concept of what a pepper is. And this is from Sarah Hoot and Brian Walsh's paper that was done uh, back in the early 2000, 2001, I think, yeah. Just showing the hybridization that takes place in this complex. And just take a look here where we get chinensi, crutescens, and annuum. And this hybridizes relatively easy. Even Bicatum can be hybridized in this complex. But pubescence, which is over here, totally isolated. It's never easily cannot move genes very easily there. And this is isoenzyme work, again, showing us the same kind of thing. Here you can go back and recognize these in a few best <coughs> type. You have the pendulum type. And this is all what is annual frutescence and chinensi. And the symbols, which is basically the squares, the triangles, and so forth, indicate that in isozymes, you can't tell these different individuals apart at all. It was an artifact of what what I often call clerical speciation. It takes place when people try to separate things too finely. No, I call it clerical, but that's what I did. And then again, this is from uh, Brian Walsh's and Sarah Hoop's paper, and it shows the same kind of thing here, annuum and frutescens, and they've shown in Galapagansi, we don't understand that, chinensi. This makes up this very clear clade that's totally related. Here's the Bicatum clade, and here's the pubescence clade. There's some details still to be worked out, but the thing I would like to say that presents a problem to us is this very excellent paper is actually based only on 12 of the some now 40 species we know. So there really is a really huge need to do a very detailed molecular study here. The chances of doing it are very, very difficult because, as I said, probably two-thirds of these species are very narrow endemics. Most people have never seen them in the wild. The one that's named after me literally occupies a very small township in Bolivia. That's the only place we've ever found it. 
the one that we named from Peru, again, is found in one very small township area in Peru. That's the only place it's known from. And getting the material all together in order to do this molecular study, I can't imagine. I can think it'd be a lot of fun getting and assembling the material, but I think it's going to be difficult to do. And then lastly, this is a study that was done by Moscone, and he's another one of Hunsinger's students. Barbosa was a Hunsinger student. And again, this pretty much, it's, it's really nice when molecular work actually comes out the way you think some of your morphological and earlier work worked out. It isn't always that case, but in Peppers, that has been pretty much that case. So you again end up here. This is pubescence, no, yeah, the pubescence con group. This is the vacated group. And you have then, somewhere, this is the Professor Sinensi annuum group. Moscone's most important discovery, however, was actually showing that capsicum has two chromosome numbers in it. It has n equals 2n24, n equals 2n equals 26, so 24 and 26. The hypothesis had been, had been one of the questions that had been posed is, what was the origin of peppers? Where did they come from? And Barbara Pickersgill published an ex pa excellent paper where she argued that Brazil was the source of it. And I published perhaps a less excellent paper, in which I argued that Bolivia was the source. And we're both right. <coughs> but you have to look at what the detail is. You have to look at the data, so to speak. So the 2N24, number occurs in all the domesticated species. The 2N26 number is basically the Brazilian species. So it's fairly clear that the domesticated species have their origin out of Bolivia, and the proposal has been that Chacoense was that ancestral gene from the pool that gave rise to the entire group. And then at some point in Brazil, there was a chromosomal transfer, transformation that led to this other whole series of peppers that have the 26 number. And what holds them all together is that one marvelous compound, capsaicin. That's what holds them together. So this is an online, and I don't even know who produced it. This is online. You can find it. And it's very accurate. It's very well done. I wish I knew who was compiled. But that's that 2N26 complex that essentially is Brazilian. There are some exceptions to that. There's 26 species in there. And then this is really the line that gave rise to the domesticates over here. It's 2n equals 24. You basically can't find that in the literature. It hasn't made it in yet. It's made into the scientific literature, but in the popular literature, people are still talking about these five domesticated species. And it simply, I think, is not true at all. Lastly, I want to say evolution doesn't stop. It's always ongoing. And if there's evolution in peppers, what's really going on now is how do we get the hottest pepper out there? That's what's going on. It's called, it's, it's the, the rush to being uh, masochists. <laughs> so this appeared in an article in National Geographic giving us this uh, scale here based on the uh, Scoville scale that we use to measure hotness. And it takes us down here to this odd thing called the Dorset Knot. Most of you have heard of it. Discovered in England in the Dorset area, but came out of the Orient. And one of the interesting things about my travels has been that everybody in the Orient knows that peppers originated there. They do not believe for a moment that the history they're dealing with is less than 450 years. We have always had peppers. They're part of our culture. They haven't have, always had peppers. They've had it for 450 years. But the irony is now in the rush to develop the hottest pepper, that is placing, taking place in the Orient. Where we find polyploid peppers today is in the Orient. There's only been one polyploid ever found in the New World, and that was in a plant in a hotel in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and we still don't know how that came about. It was one of the ancestral annuals, but it was a tetraploid. And there's one more slide. So this is a very recent thing on the cold scoville scale. I put it in here for several reasons. And that is to realize 
why some things have become so important. The pure capsaicin is tested 15 million. Okay. And here you have the mace that we use to spray. Two, 5.3 million. That's why it drops people to their feet very quickly. And now we're trying to eat things that are somewhere between 1 and 2.5 million. And we're crazy. Thank you very much. <laughs> For any of you who want it, I have a shorter summary of this that I can just give you as a handout. Uh, I thought you'd find it interesting to see where we are and what we know about that. Thanks. Thank you.